getting into the minor. Keegan. Keegan, Keegan, Keegan. My jacket, my back. Welcome everyone. Please rise in body or in spirit as we start to worship the Lord today.
Hey, good morning. Happy Friday, Westmont. Happy Friday, Happy Friday Scott. Um, it's so great to be together um, on this last day before four-day weekend. I am sure you are excited about that, as am I. So last spring sing, um, one of my favorite side acts was the Siblings of Westmont one. So was anyone involved in that? Yes. Okay. I thought it was hilarious. Um, so who here has had a relative attend Westmont? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, me. All right. Who here has had a sibling attend Westmont? Here we go. Okay. It's a glorious thing to go to the same school as your sibling. I remember growing up at James T. Jones Elementary School in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan one year. Uh, when all the fourth graders just referred to me in a song as Avery's little brother, Avery's little brother, and it drove me crazy. Well, James T. Jones Elementary is not the only school my brother Avery and I both went to. We also are both graduates of Westmont. Yes, I followed him here. He's my older brother, and yes, he is our chapel speaker today. So, um, yeah. Avery graduated from Westmont in the spring of 2007, just a few months before I started here in the fall of 2007. I'll share with you just a few biographical details about him. He is the eldest of four siblings, and figure this out, he is tied with our other two siblings as my mom's secret, second favorite child. Avery is married to Allie, and she is here with their three kids, Blake, Micah, and Jane. Avery studied political science at Westmont, uh, but instead of pursuing a law career after college, he ended up pursuing something very similar, beach volleyball, um, after getting hooked at East Beach and has been a beach volleyball professional for over a decade, uh, playing with the elite players in the world. That's one of the more impressive things about him, also that he started playing beach volleyball after we grew up in Redlands, California, like an hour from any beach. <laughs> Any, anyone from Redlands here? Yeah, yeah Franny. Okay, yeah. Um, he also serves as the youth pastor and does ministry at New City Church in El Segundo, which is in the South Bay of Los Angeles. Um, Avery has been a trailblazer and a rock in my life since our earliest days. I could go on and on about our relationship. Uh, we were the best man in each other's weddings, etc. But I didn't just invite him to speak because he is my brother, um, but because I have been a witness to God's powerful work in his life. He knows in his bones that God is his good shepherd who will lead us into good things when we give our lives to him. I know he has a story and lessons to share that can build us up as a community. And I also know that he really loves this community at Westmont um, and cares deeply about you and your generation with the heart of a pastor. Uh, he loves this generation so much that he is low-key, fairly conversant in Gen Z idioms. Um, uh, so please welcome my brother Avery to chapel today to bring us the word. Thanks, brother. Thanks, man. Love you, dude. Look, girl. Love you guys. <laughs> Good morning, Westmont. How are you guys? Who, who's from Redlands? Let's go. <laughs> Redlands High School or Rev? You know, it's just embarrassing because I go to the high school you go to. You, oh, wait, which, which high school? I went to a private school, like now we're away. Oh, that's okay. You went to private school? I get it. No, I totally get it. <laughs> I totally get it. No, <laughs> I'm not mad at that at all. Well, yeah, good morning, you guys. It's such a blessing for me to be back here um, after I graduated from Westmont in 2007. That's almost 20 years ago. I can't believe it. Um, so my name is Avery Drost. I am, I am Evan's older brother. He mentioned my family's here today in the front row. Um, I brought a couple pictures of them if you can't see them. So my, this is my wife, Allie, who's here, front row, with our, with our oldest daughter, Blake. Um, Allie is it's one of my favorite pictures of her, my beautiful wife, Allie. And uh, she's a local girl. She grew up in Ventura. Anybody from Ventura in here? Lots of people from Ventura. Buena High School? Anybody from Buena High School? Bulldogs? Cool. <laughs> she grew up in Ventura. Uh, Ali and I met in September in 2008. We met on the beach in Ventura playing beach volleyball. So that's how God brought us together was 
through the sport of beach volleyball. And I think I was in love with her from the very first time that I saw Allie back then. And we got married later on in June 2012, so almost 12 years ago. We have three beautiful kids, like Evan mentioned. They're all here today, and I brought a picture of them. Oh, sorry, that's Allie and I back when we were when we met, and those are our three kids. So the, the oldest girl there is Blake, she's seven years old. And then the little boy with missing his bottom teeth, that's Micah, he's five years old, and TK. And down at the bottom, that's baby Jane, and she has her first birthday on Tuesday. <laughs> so if you see her, you say hi, she would love to wave and smile at you for sure. Uh, so that's some background on me, of course, but the most important thing you, know, you need to know about me, you already just heard, and that is that, is that uh, I am Eben's older brother, and um, your chapel music director, Eben, is my brother. Uh, can we please just give it up for Eben one more time? No. <laughs> I love my brother. Eben and I are two and a half years apart, exactly to the day. I'm two and a half years older. I'm the oldest in the family, followed by Eben, and then like he mentioned, there's two more. We have a younger brother, Harrison, and a sister, Madeline. We love each other, we're really close. Um, but since Eben and I are the closest in age, just as far back as I can remember in my life, Eben has been my best friend, like my absolute best friend all my life. Uh, I love him, I'm super grateful for him in my life, everything he's meant to me. I think you probably know this about him already, but Eben is the most selfless person uh, that you're ever gonna meet in, your, in, this, in this world. Uh, it's really the first thing I think about when I, when I try to describe my brother is just he's radically compassionate and others first in his life. That's just how he is. Uh, Evan's the kind of brother that I would play too rough with when we were kids and I would hurt him, like physically hurt him, and it would be my fault. Um, but he would literally like hide his wounds from my mom and dad so that I wouldn't get in trouble because he was such a good brother to me, such a good, such a good guy. <laughs> Does that come as a surprise to you guys? Does that sound like Evan? Probably not, right? That's just how he is. Um, and you might think to yourself that somebody who's that gracious and other-centered, somebody that's like that could just be like a people pleaser and try to get along with everyone and avoid conflict. But if you guys know Eben, you know that what's really going on is he's just on a totally different level of boldness and conviction in his faith. That's what makes him who he is. It's his faith in Christ. Um, he just loves the Lord in a profound way and he really doesn't care what it costs him to love his neighbor as himself. Doesn't care. And it doesn't, he doesn't care what it costs for him to make Jesus the king of his life. And I've seen the evidence of that over and over in all my years with him. Um, I don't remember a time in my life without Evan, so it's the way he's always been. Uh, you guys already know how musically talented Evan is. That's what you get to witness all the time. This has been going on since we were kids. He's always been this kind of musical talent. But I wonder if you guys know about Evan's high school band, The Gimps. You guys know about The Gimps? Oh. So when Evan was in high school, he was in a high school punk rock band called The Gimps. Check it out. <laughs> That's Evan on the guitar. That's not him singing. Although Evan is a talented singer too, and Evan was the... the the musical force behind that band, The Gimps. The Gimps were awesome. You guys don't even know. <laughs> Evan, has, Evan has so many musical talents, um, from punk rock music to, uh, to reggae, ska, everything Evan touches musically t turns to gold. Um, I really think that Evan could be anywhere in the world, honestly, right now, writing songs for the biggest artists, performing with the biggest bands in the world. I truly believe that. Um, God's given him a, an incredible musical gift. But I really want you guys to know this. He and I talk all the time um, about this school and about his love for you guys. Um, it's very deep and sincere. He works really, really hard to prepare meaningful worship for you guys every chapel. He prays for you. He struggles over you and your hearts and your, uh, your circumstances. And, and when you're going through it, he's going through it with you in a very sincere way. And I, just, I want you guys to really know that when you run into him, how how deeply he cares for you and, and why he's doing this with his life, and, you know, instead of any of the things that he could do with his talent. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'm just super proud of my brother. I love you, man, and I'm very glad to have the chance to be here and to tell you that in front of all your students. I really love you. Okay, so today in chapel, I, I don't have very much time, but I brought a scripture that I wanted to share with you, 
and that I hope this will be an encouragement to you, as well as a challenge, as well as a challenge. Uh, the title of this quick message is called Raised by God, and I want to share with you the story of my life as a young person uh, who grew very slowly, and how God was patient with me, and how he nurtured me, and how he steadily led me along the path of life, and how he's still doing that for me today, how he's still doing that for all of us today. Um, I'm going to put it up on the screen here, but I want to read... I want to read Psalm 103 over you, starting in verse 8. This comes from the NLT. This was the translation that I thought was the most, the most spirit-filled for me. I want you to listen to how kindly God the Father fathers us. Just listen to his approach to raising us as sons and daughters. Let's see. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor will he remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, Tender and compassionate to those who fear him, for he knows how weak we are. He remembers that we are only dust. We pray with me. Father, thank you for your word that you give us as a picture of who you are. Thank you that through the poetry of the, of the, of the Psalms that you've revealed yourselves not only to our minds but to our hearts so that we can understand the kind of God that you are, what you're like. And we pray that you would just open our minds to understand more of how you are today, what we Will we receive the word in chapel? Would you just bless the words of my mouth to be faithful and truthful to you? I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, as you already know, uh, I'm a dad now myself. You met Allie and my three kids who are here today. Um, and in studying Psalm 103 over the last few months, I've learned a lot about my own parenting by reflecting on the way God has raised, God, uh, God raises us, and particularly how he's raised me over the years. Um, of course, most of us here aren't moms and dads yet, but, and, and this isn't really meant to be a talk about parenting as much as it's meant to be a look at the character of God and the way that he deals with us as his children. Remember John 1, or 1 John 3, 1 says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. So Evan and I grew up, like he mentioned, in Redlands, California. If you guys know where that is, it's southeast of here, about two and a half hours away, super far from any beaches. Um, I mentioned already that we were four kids in the house, and we were really blessed to have our mom and dad um, who loved us. They loved us a lot. But most of our lives when we were young, our parents were really going through it in their marriage in a, in a very real way. Uh, we struggled financially. Um, home could be really chaotic, inconsistent, uh, physical, gnarly. Our dad was a super loving man. Uh, he really cared about his wife and his children, but his life was fractured and, and harmed by a lot of physical and emotional pain and anger and drug addiction. And uh, for a lot of our lives, he and my mom were separated. Our mom was always really sweet and attentive to us when we were kids. It's a wonderful mom, but as we grew and life got heavy, she was stretched really thin trying to take care of all four of us. Um, it was hard for her to be on top of all these maturing and coming of age things that you would hope that young kids can learn before they leave the house. Kind of the transition from little kid stuff to grown up stuff. You understand what I mean? And so I came out of high school just so immature. Um, and I pretty much continued to act that way in my first semester here when I got to Westmont in 2004. I didn't have a sense of who I was. Uh, way worse than that, I didn't have a vision of who I wanted to be at all. Um, if I could get people's approval by going to IV and raging and doing everything that that was about, that's what I did. Uh, if girls gave me attention, I liked how that felt. I did whatever I thought I had to do to keep their attention. Good, bad, whatever. I wasn't a mature friend. I didn't know how to build relationships on the right foundations. I did ignorant things to other people. I told lies to fit in. Um, I made a mess. John 11.10 says, it is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. And that was me. Uh, I just didn't know what I was doing. I was way behind. 
My experience at Westmont is that some of us arrive here coming from very solid foundations, solid situations with good community, tight friendships, healthy relationships with our parents, um, mature development. Some of us get here pretty far along in that, in that way. Others, others of us feel like they're just not as far along. Um, and maybe that's a reality, they're not as far along, or they just feel that way when they look around by comparison. Or it's both. Some respond in that situation by growing cynical and negative. And that's not just about the culture, but kind of about the whole world and, and, and where it's going. And in frustration, they suppress the idea that God truly loves them and has a way in mind for them that's more real than what makes sense on the surface. You understand what I mean? Others just get defeated. They back out of community and they isolate and they put themselves away. They convince themselves that they don't have what it takes to thrive like other people, that they never will, and that they're better off on their own. And I have felt all of those things in my life. I think that even those of us who were well built up in our upbringing, perhaps more than anyone, look critically at themselves, envisioning what they could or they should be by this point. And that they imagine a God who is equally dissatisfied with them. There are four points that I want to share with you that come to mind from Psalm 103 and what it teaches us. The first one is this. The Father is process-oriented in the way that he raises us. Process-oriented. Trust the process, like Philly 76 years say. God raises us with a long-term vision of progress and growth as we go along. He doesn't grow exasperated, and he doesn't give up on us when we continue to make the same mistakes, and he doesn't get sick of us like we get sick of each other when we keep doing the same things. He remains patient, merciful, and understanding. A lot of you guys probably know Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on into completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Heard that, yeah? Remember, guys, that even though the disciples left everything to get up and follow Jesus, they didn't immediately understand everything. In fact, it was the total opposite. For years, they walked with Jesus literally side by side, and they struggled to comprehend his ways and his teachings. But it was the plan of God all along to build his church by discipling 12 ordinary men in all their flaws and all their shortcomings, raising them in the knowledge and the love of God, and then sending them out into the world. Jesus did a very small percentage of lecturing, like I'm lecturing you right now. Once in a while he got up and he gave, he gave lessons and teachings to the masses like this, but the vast majority of his ministry was done through discipleship, which was a constant bringing along of individuals so that they would get to know him and understand him through process. And we all read the Bible and study along how the, how the disciples failed over and over to get the point. Just like Jesus didn't get sick of them, our Father doesn't get sick of us now. Even though they were slow to understand, Jesus was slow to anger. He disciplined them and he corrected them, but he didn't tally up their missteps and their failures and hold it against them. You understand? Like the disciples, Jesus calls us to stand up out of the place where we were, so to get up out of our mess when he finds us. But then he calls us to begin to follow him. And that departure represents the beginning of a process through which he's going to be faithful to lead us into sanctification. And sanctification, as you guys probably know, means to become more like him. And that is a process. Number two, God's patience is part of his character and so is his love for us. Do you guys know that Exodus 34, six through seven, I was really nervous to make this assertion because here I am back at, back at uh, the college where I first began to study the Old Testament. But I'm gonna make this assertion and a professor can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Exodus 34, six through seven is, according to my sources, the most referenced passage in the Hebrew scriptures. I don't know if Dr. Fisk is here, maybe he can confirm that for me, but it says this, as he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Okay, so my kids are right here. Myself as a dad, guys, I so easily let my own fatigue or my stress shorten my fuse with my kids. And if their mistakes aren't bothering me, sometimes I just turn a blind eye, 
but if they're causing me grief with their behavior and they're giving me a hard time or their, their, their behavior is inconvenient to me at the time, I can react in ways that are way out of proportion. I can react in a way, um, a, a, a less patient way with my kids than I would be, I, I could be more impatient with my kids than I would be with anyone else that I met in my life. And um, it's agonizing for me to say that, but my appreciation of them can kind of rise and fall depending on how they're acting. And that's, that's the truth. But God by nature is not like that. His slowness to anger and his patience means that he looks at us in our struggles and, he, and our weaknesses. He doesn't any less enjoy walking with us side by side. Any less. I run out of patience and deal harshly with my kids and others all the time. God deals with me like a tender father all the time. To describe his love for us, the psalmist had to speak in terms of infinitives. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sin as far from us as the east is from the west. Infinite distances to describe this. God's, God's posture towards us. Um, does anyone in here ever get tired of themselves and give in to fault finding? Counting the issues with yourself. Remember, guys, that there is an enemy who is called the accuser. And he is on a mission to tear you down from the inside out through that kind of talk. And the Father who loves us will not constantly accuse us, Psalm 103 says. He won't discourage us. He's never over us, no matter how far we have to go. Amen? Number three, and I gotta hurry. God is raising us as a family, not just as individuals. Okay, so here at Westmont, I wanna remind you that you have one of the most awesome opportunities that you're ever gonna have in your life, and I want you guys to take advantage of this. So please listen to me now. If you're studying or if you're looking at your phone, I totally see you. Please look at me right now because you only have so much time when you're here. Okay, when I got here as a 17-year-old, like I said, I was way behind in maturity. I was, I was way behind. Uh, so I was also new as a volleyball player, and I had really just started to learn this game of volleyball late in high school. I was okay at it, but back then we had a team here at school. We had an indoor team, and I was just good enough to be on the squad, but I had a lot to learn. I was struggling. Um, the shuttle is still a thing, right? The still shuttle? Okay, cool. Well, I mean, kind of cool. Um, okay, so one day I rode the shuttle down to East Beach, and I got to blast through this for time, but like Evan mentioned, I discovered beach volleyball at East Beach. It completely changed my life. Like, I fell in love with it. It became my, my passion, and, and I pursued it with all my heart, beach volleyball, when I discovered it down here at East Beach. Um, during that time in my life, I had teammates, competitors, people around me who pushed me and challenged me. They told me the truth. They didn't overlook all the dumb things I did. But they showed me forgiveness and love, and they didn't give up on me. And it was one of the greatest difference makers in my life. Like, it totally changed me to have a community that, that interacted with me in that way. And a lot of that came through the volleyball community, but it came through the Westmont community. Um, just to summarize this really fast, this is a very long story. God's led me in almost 15 years of playing professional beach volleyball, competing on the AVP tour all over the world. He's used this community to teach me lessons and to shape me, to discipline me, um, and that process is still going on to this day. I'm 37 years old, and he's still sharpening me through this, uh, through this grind. But God will use teachers here and mentors and friendships and even the conflicts that you're experiencing to develop you as you grow. And he'll do that here in this community around you, so don't check out of the community. Be a part of what's going on here. Lean into your friendships and your relationships. Allow those things to form you. If you feel like you're behind and growing into the rest of the culture, or if you feel like you're just not where you want to be, let other people get you there. Don't isolate from them and hide from them. That's one of the things that you can do with your time while you're here. Um, and remember to deal with each other by viewing each other the way Christ looks at us, with patience, kindness, compassion. Remember that we're brothers and sisters. Okay. Point number four, God is a loving and a true authority over our lives. This is the challenge aspect of what I wanted to bring to you today. Okay, so personally, I love to be challenged. I've always viewed challenge as being an act of love. I like when people call me out and tell me what they need me to do because I view it as an act of trust in me. Like, Avery, I need you to do this. And what I hear is, you think that I can do it? Yes, sir, I'll do it. You understand? But, so I, I like that. But I know that every older generation loves to find fault in the younger generation but that's not what our father is like. I think that all of us dream 
to live a long, full life of significance and value. Uh, Comfort and ease don't fulfill us. Adventure and impact fulfill us. I believe that this is what God offers us when we follow him. He he offers us true adventure, um, true fulfillment, true impact in our lives. Um, And uh, I think that that's an important part of your generation is that this generation in particular is called to fulfillment versus um, versus uh, comfort and success and ease. Um, one of the things that came up a couple times in this section of Psalm 103 is this idea of fearing God. The scripture uses the phrase, those who fear God. So who are those people? This is very a common question, I'm sure, for believers at any age, young people who are studying the Bible, or even all those of us who have studied it for a long time. I think the simplest way to understand the fear of God is a right view of the holiness and the dominion of God and where everything else stands in relation to that. Would you guys agree? I think that scripture goes to great lengths to establish that order for us so that we can try to comprehend the height at which God stands and how low we are in comparison. Remember that mankind first sinned in the garden by denying that God's authority over us was righteous and good. That was our first mistake. And to this day, the hardest thing for many people to buy into is this idea that there's an authority that's good, that knows better for you than you might know for yourself, and righteously reigns over us. That's hard, to submit ourselves in that way. Um, I'm about out of time, but I would, I would like to give you, I could give you a whole different sermon on like why the authority of God is trustworthy and, and, and right for your life and why it's okay to subject yourself to it. Um, why God is true and beautiful and leads us to the greatest freedom. But I'm just gonna ask you, open your heart to that. If you are still searching for that truth, open your heart to it and try to receive it. The fact that God is so holy, so righteous, so good, and yet deals with us the way Psalm 103 describes with patience and forgiveness and tenderness and mercy, this truth ought to move our heart towards Jesus with a force that nothing can stop as we realize the truth of that. You understand? And just so let the reality of God, let the reality of who God is and how he deals with you break your heart this morning. Going into this weekend, take up his invitation to follow and give him authority over your life and be formed by him as he leads you patiently, and I'm here to testify that you won't be disappointed. Okay, very last thing. Can I have like one more minute? Okay. Okay, cool. So the title of this message, like I said, is Raised by God. It's a little bit of a play on words. If you know Eben, I know that he loves puns and plays on words. I'm not quite as bad as him, but I'm kind of like that too. So this idea of being raised, I'm talking to you about how God raises us like children over time, how he like fathers us. But we know that God will one day raise us up in glory, right? Will raise us at the end to be with him in eternity. Um, I think Eben has shared with you that in 2020, our dad passed away and it was kind of tragic and you shouldn't have, we shouldn't have lost him, but we lost dad in 2020. And Eben read something at his service that has stuck with me really tight ever since. It actually comes from a funeral rite um, in the Book of Common Prayer. Um, And it goes like this. It says, I am resurrection and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though he die. And everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my awakening, he will raise me up and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. Isn't that beautiful? That we'll see God in our bodies when he raises us up out of this life and everything that's wrong with it. John 6, 39 through 40 says, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. How many of you are glad that this is true? You can put your hand up. How many of you are glad that God will raise us up again and that this isn't all we have? How many of you can live better today because you know this is true? Because you know that he'll raise us up. Can we live better today? 
But don't forget that just like this father, just like a father, God is raising you right now. Sanctification is the process that we're going through right now, becoming more like Jesus. You guys are not a finished product. I wasn't a finished product when I sat in these seats. I couldn't even have imagined where God had, would lead me now, you know, 37 years old and this beautiful family and everything else that he's given me. But it's a process through which I had to go. Don't give up. Believe in what the Father is doing you and in your brothers and sisters. Memorize these words of his. Hold on to him when things get hard. And when you're old like me, you can look back and you can see for sure that he has never given up on you. You guys pray with me? Okay. Father, thank you for these students. Thank you for their teachers and the staff and everyone who's here making this college a beacon of your light in this world. I pray that their time here at this school would be an opportunity for them to continue to grow in you and be developed in you and to be raised by you. Thank you that you raise us like the father that you are and not like the impatient father that I am. Thank you that you never get sick of us and you never get tired of, of watching us progress and you're never any less interested in us than, uh, than you are right now. Um, just thank you, God, that we can't, we can't push you away by our missteps. Um, we love you, Lord. I pray that right now you would uh, you'd bless our worship, that you would just make the band crush it and that everyone would be uh, moved to worship and um, send us out into this weekend with a special measure of your grace. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Every next time the, the Lord gives you a word, uh, just for me, maybe we could just go to lunch instead of you having to share that in front of everybody. Thank you. That's powerful. Um, I have so many things to say, one of which is all the Drost men are really good looking. Uh, secondly, um, if you take your phone out now, and by the way, when you're on your phone or doing your homework during chapel, I'm embarrassed for you. But now you could take your phone out and... Take, it, take this little deal, and even during worship, it's okay today, during worship, to, to fill this out, because part of your transformation, and Avery's message this morning really is part of the series I'm doing, that just fit in beautifully, part of our transformation is in engagement, and in serving, and finding ways to be a part of God's people and God's work, so uh, we want to do this a couple times a year, today's the day, and let's worship the Lord. Worship. As we continue in worship, I invite you to stand in body or in spirit. There are going to be uh, resident chaplains in the corners if you want prayer. But let's 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 worship and be in awe of the God who is patient with us.
delighted to be giving you guys the benediction for today. Um, but before I do, I had a brief announcement to make about um, submissions being open for the Phoenix Magazine, which is our campus's literary arts magazine. So if you have any um, photography or artwork, poetry, songs, um, really anything that you would like to share, um, we are publishing uh, this spring. And uh, so yeah, hopefully, uh, please scan the QR code to submit, and we'll, um, you know, you'll have the opportunity to um, apply to be published or um, in print on our um, our Phoenix album, perhaps. Uh, yeah, excited to see what you guys have to offer. So thank you so much. <laughs> I forgot the benediction. Um, <laughs> one second. Um, Yes, so, <clears throat> may you sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. May you be full of his praise and glory. Go in peace, Westmont. Thank you. Shepherd, and he goes before me. 